This talk, Carbon Zero and How We Get There, will cover, will cover some of the issues we need to address to change the system. What is needed and what does the response to COVID-19 demonstrate is now possible. And I'm so pleased, almost starstruck, to be joined by Paul Allen, the Centre for Alternative Technology and the author of Zero Carbon Britain, Dr Andrew Sims of the New Weather Alliance and Rapid Transition Network and co-author of How Do We Do That, and Professor Julia Steinberger of Leeds University, who researches into living well within limits. To start with, I'd like to give each of the panellists five minutes uh, to introduce their particular subject and how you see us getting to carbon zero. I'll introduce the Rapid Transition Alliance, which is a fairly new um, initiative. It started about a year and a half ago. Our idea is to look at evidence-based hope in a warming world. It's on the basis that we all know the climate is changing faster than we are. So we're looking for examples, both historically and currently around the world, which do indicate our ability to change at the speed and scale that the climate science tells us is necessary. So up to now, we've been looking at everything from examples of the rollout of the railway network in the 19th century. For example, in the UK, you had nearly four and a half thousand miles of railway rolled out in just about seven years. And we've looked at experiences in, in other times of kind of extreme hardship and difficulty, like wartime and how quickly we've re-engineered economies. We've looked at what happened um, around the time of the OPEC crisis, the oil crisis at the end of the Cold War, and indeed some of the changes which happened almost overnight at the time of the financial crisis. So for example, for all the talk of there never being a magic money tree, the way that it was suddenly discovered you could have something called quantitative easing, which had much the same effect or could potentially have much the same effect. Um, so that's one of the things that we're doing and um, we're building a constituency. So if there are people listening in who are part of organizations who would like to be part of the Rapid Transition Alliance, please go to the website rapidtransition.org and you can get in touch with us via that. Um, we're also looking for uh, innovative policy interventions that can help move us in the direction of the zero carbon economy. And um, we're on the anniversary of Earth Day today, but uh, in 2018, it was the anniversary of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And we used that anniversary to float the idea of a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, which has now become an international campaign in its own right. But moving kind of swiftly up to the moment, because obviously, you know, we were set up to look at and try and take lessons from moments of um, great upheaval and great change. And of course, we're living through one of the greatest for a generation right now. And over the last few weeks, we've been looking at examples of and dimensions of what's happening at the moment which throw up potential lessons and interesting dynamics that we can uh, learn from as we try to move to the zero carbon economy. So we've been having a series of crisis conversations around a similar theme to um, Reset TV. We've been calling them Reset 2 in fact. And I'm going to, you can find many of these examples written out in more detail, but I'm going to run through just a few of the examples which I think point to the potential for rapid change in the direction we need to go. So one of them of course is around questions of industrial conversion. We've seen examples in the last few weeks of textile makers turning to making personal protective equipment. We've seen everything from brewers to perfume makers making sanitizing hand gel. We've seen car makers making medical equipment and breathing aids. And there are big analogies there for the speed with which changes like that have happened historically too. Um, if you want a current example of a whole area trying to repurpose itself for industrial conversion in this way, you'd look at, you'd look at the city of Aberdeen, which has um, been obviously serving the offshore oil and gas industry and is now trying to reinvent itself as the basis for renewable energy. One of the other areas of interest at the moment is this very concept of unnecessary travel. We've suddenly learned that we can save a lot of time and money and carbon by connecting in the way that we are at the moment, by, by online. And even we've seen the head of uh, an organization uh, which is synonymous with the car lobby, the AA, turning around and saying he can't imagine us going back to how it was before with people wanting to be stuck in traffic, driving to a meeting when they can just as easily do it from the comfort um, of a laptop. We've had time liberated in this way, which can make us better citizens. New patterns of work, of course, as well. It doesn't work for everybody, but for people who can work from home, the idea that you can work from home and save time on commuting enables you to be, um, it frees up time to be a better community member, maybe to get involved with your transition town initiative. Um, active citizenship opens up. 
We've seen shifts in consumer behavior under uh, people responding to an, an understood threat to public health and well-being. We've seen uh, responses in terms of understanding sort of effectively the rationing of, of, of goods in shops, the ideas of fair shares, ideas of special opening times for more vulnerable members of the community and indeed um, key workers. We've seen people reskilling as they get back to cooking for themselves at home, reinventing sort of homemade entertainment, potentially lower carbon activity activities and shift towards seeing the importance in a resilient system of having an, an active food supply chain. Um, more broadly, bigger lessons we can take from the pandemic response, of course, come from understanding the need for forward planning and prevention. In the past, I've worked um, in international development on disaster preparedness and disaster responses. And we know that the better prepared we are, um, the lower the impact of any particular um, any particular impact. But in terms of very particular climate um, emergency um, parallels and lessons, we also now understand the link between environmental degradation and the spread of vector-borne diseases. And this term that's come into common usage recently, zoonosis, the transfer of diseases from animals to people. And we know that in a warming world and in an environmentally degraded world, that's more likely to happen more often. We also understand that there are direct links between air pollution and death rates from COVID-19. So yeah. not only are some of the answers to COVID-19 and some of the things we need to do to move into, in, in the direction of a, a zero carbon economy, I think they're, they're, they're very hardwired linked. So uh, I think I'd round off by saying that if there's one big central insight, and I think one of the areas where we've got enormous potential to move forward, is that breaking out of the community of people who've been actively involved in campaigning on climate issues. I think for the first time, there's been, in first time in a generation, there's been a generally held view now that what matters more important than short-term economic interests is putting public health and well-being first and that seems to have kind of settled across the board now of course there's one or two angry voices contrarian voices that uh, are shouting back in the other direction in the United States but I think overwhelmingly internationally we've seen this idea that we should put public health and well-being first and that some of the answers that we're looking forward for in a zero carbon world are exactly overlapping those concerns they are ways of putting public health health and well-being first. So I'll shut up there and hand over to my far better informed colleagues. My area of research is sort of falls between the social and, and physical sciences because I try to look at how much stuff we need to live well. And so that means you first you have to understand people and their well-being and their health and what they depend upon. And you also have to understand the social uh, structures that would allow them to have that. Uh, and to be provisioned with that in a sort of secure, reliable way. And that's something that Andrew was talking about, uh, obviously, very much. And then we have to understand sort of what the material and energy engineering underpinnings of that are, which obviously leads us to carbon emissions. And just to say some of the things that we've been able to do within my um, Living Well Within Limits project, so recently, uh, just within the past month, basically, we've had uh, quite a few of our results were able to come out uh, for instance, on looking at energy inequality around the world, so what people actually use energy on depending on how rich they are, and um, what are the products and categories that are the most energy intensive, most used by rich people, as opposed to more used by poor people. Uh, so we're able to do that kind of mapping, which is very important to understand where excess is and where deficit is and how to, um, to design policies, for instance. Um, we've done a study on that was also published recently trying to understand how much energy could growth in energy could explain the growth in human well-being so the increase in life expectancy and it turns out not very much um, but some types of energy and some types of consumption are very linked to that increase in, in life expectancy and others aren't and so it becomes important to understand what is coupled and what is decoupled in terms of being able to provision um, to provision well-being more sustainably. Uh, the other piece of research that should be submitted tomorrow, so it's not public yet, but I'm willing to send drafts to anybody if you just put your emails in the chat, um, is on decent living energy. So we're taking this uh, a concept that was developed by Narasimha Rao at the University of Yale, and we made a global model of what would be the energy requirements for everybody to have sufficient, which is not just beyond poverty, it's really actually quite nice. Uh, standards of living and what that would mean in terms of if we think about efficient technology in the future. And it might not surprise you that despite economic, uh, despite population growth, 
uh, this is a fraction of the energy that we're consuming right now, and it becomes much more plausible to supply sufficient energy if uh, um, we don't have excess. And it might become much more plausible to supply that sufficient level of energy with renewable sources, for instance. So those are some of the things that we study sort of on the quantitative side. On the, but we also like to study why we're trapped in patterns of destructive, high emission, um, high consumption resource use. And we believe that has to do with the political economy of the way things are set up. So the fact that there are people profiting and making lots of money from unsustainable practices and so we just published a study on the production of car dependence, for instance. So why car dependence is something that is the main product of the automotive industry, the road industry, um, deliberate neglect of public transportation. So on how these things sort of fit together and create a culture of car dependency or uh, that sees cars as something uh, very valuable and, and necessary. Uh, of course, transport is the most energy, one of the most energy intensive ways that people can consume and it's also uh, predominantly consumed by rich people. So those are the kinds of thorny issues we look at. Um, and I think that that kind of knowledge helps us think about where we want to go and why it's realistic to get there. Um, that it involves uh, a struggle against current economic structures, not necessarily against technology, <laughs> the technology is there, uh, but definitely against economic structures that are um, promoting wasteful and um, excess consumption and environmentally damaging consumption. Um, I would just like also to say that I'm currently within uh, coronavirus and all of these other things that are happening right now, uh, including the battle lines that are being drawn. Uh, I see the world in a less rosy way than Andrew does possibly, which is that I think that there is really an opposition forming. There is, um, there are people who, for a while, everybody thought that we could say, oh, public health is important, well-being is important. But I think that there are definitely actors right now who do not who are who are leading the counter battle to that, and they are surprise surprise the exact same people who don't want to act on climate change, who've been pushing discourses of delay on climate change. So I think we need to think very strongly about how to reshape our economy and our politics away from them. Uh, I wrote a piece on pandemics uh, in open democracy, which you might want to have a look at, which is sort of my proposal around that. And I was really pleased to see a statement of. Dutch economists, um, 170 of them, saying that we need degrowth. We need degrowth of, sect of entire sectors, like the fossil fuel sectors, uh, in the aftermath of COVID-19. And I think that that's the kind of thing that we really need to do. We need to push for an entire different economic structure. So that's what I'm happy to talk about today. It's really interesting hearing you talking about the piece you did around cars. I spent uh, well, better part of a decade and a half as a local county council, as a local councillor, and as eight years as a county councillor. And the uh, given that road building is a good thing and increasing infrastructure for cars is a good thing across the entire political spectrum, uh, apart from the Greens, is amazing. And just how ingrained it is and how mad you're seen uh, if you speak against it is just. Oh, yeah, unbelievable. Paul, you've got five minutes. Well, the Centre for Alternative Technology has been trying to reshape the relationship between human beings and technology for over 40 years. We've come to understand the wicked nature of the climate problem, particularly. There is no single solution. The problem itself has feedbacks. It's getting worse. I suppose it's deeply physically and culturally entwined with how we do things. And it's entwined with what we used to think of as normal, because what we used to think of as normal before the lockdown began was actually an energy extreme lifestyle where our physical infrastructure had been remanufactured to make us consume more than we need. And our internal psychological infrastructure had been recombined to make us think more about ourselves as consumers rather than citizens. And we recognise getting there too slowly is the same as failing. We need wicked solutions to overcome the wicked problems. We need solutions that feed back on each other, that motivate societal shifts. So basically, from our point of view, it needs a team effort. We need the tech sector, the NGOs, the academics, the activists, the arts, etc., all need to recognize they are organs in a collective team zero organism. So we want to play our part in this emergent organism and so we've been developing the Zero Carbon Britain project since 2007. 
And normally when we think 10, 20, 30 years in the future, it's ecological collapse and dystopia with zombies coming through the ruins. If we want to think about a positive future, we have to revitalize those muscles in our brains for imagining a positive future. But if we really want to convince other people, then it's not just something we imagine. We have to do a lot of data work. So we've spent a lot of time, about 13 years, refining and developing ends point scenarios where Britain has got to net zero, but rooted in 10 years worth of real hourly data, hour by hour, or to open new conversations and to help support the wider team. There's two fundamental processes involved, powering down the amount of energy we use to deliver society's goals, while at the same time powering up 100% clean renewables. We go through energy, we look at transport, we look at buildings, food, land use, and we make this research free to download for everybody. But we've also collated and analysed a whole range of international models, 100% renewable Tanzania or Los Angeles. And we've also explored the barriers to how we can make this happen, including many real life case studies. So we offer all of this in a free to download toolkit report. We also run regular Zero Carbon Britain training workshops. And we're, we engage with all sorts of different sectors of, of arts and society shift organizations, because basically the key findings we've come up with are quite exciting. We have all the technologies to do this. We're not desperately trying to invent another type of battery or another type of wind turbine, all the technologies there. And if we look at the costs, the costs of those technologies are dropping as the costs drop, the scale increases, so they invest in manufacturing and look at more efficient ways of producing things, so it gets cheaper again, so more people buy it, so it becomes viable in more locations. And so we recognize that there are feedbacks within that, which makes it a wicked solution. But we've also engaged with this incredible new leadership, which is emerging and feeding back on itself towards a tipping point where doing it becomes the new normal. We've engaged with councils, active citizens, youth, business. And we've also witnessed dappled rays of a zero carbon future out there in real life, on the ground. We just need to connect them and replicate them. But perhaps the most exciting wicked solution is the multi-solving, is that actually doing what we need to do to get to net zero brings enormous amounts of jobs. It improves air quality, it improves health, it improves diets, it improves land use, it improves space for nature. So it's actually not that we'll be sitting in a cave eating insects off the wall as some uh, climate deniers would like to uh, make you think. It's actually quite an exciting future. But the challenge is we don't have much time to do it. We really have to get on. So as we're coming out of this sort of lockdown crisis, we're going to see a big economic reboot strategy coming out, big sort of uh, investment in getting the economy going again. This is where we have to be really smart and make sure that that investment actually kickstarts the net zero transition. It doesn't try to take us back to a world where we're living energy extreme lifestyles. How does what you're talking about get put into actual practice? Well, I think everything that we've been talking about has been put into practice by some forward thinking community scale organization by some government in some country there are real life dappled rays of that out there everywhere and i'd like to ask andrew what what are the most exciting motivational examples of the dappled rays of the zero carbon future or the scale and speed that we've seen that have most motivated him if you just look at the dynamics and the contours of the climate debate itself, I think for those of us who've been working on it for you know two or three decades or more, the way that it's changed in just the last one, two, three years has been um, quite extraordinary. I think the coming together of the IPCC's special report on 1.5 degrees with the school strike for climate and indeed XR itself saw an absolute um, phase shift in the way, in the level of awareness of the problem and the, um, the readiness to do something about it. I think we're just, we've, at the point where there's about internationally about 1500 
um, jurisdictions have declared climate emergencies, um, representing populations of about 850 million people, and that's all happened in an incredibly short frame of time. I think the discovery of um, what's sometimes called in the trade, uh, you know, sort of novel or innovative economic mechanisms has um, pulled the wool from people's eyes about the power and the potential of an active um, state to actually deliver on change. This idea that there was no so-called magic money tree, that, that we had to live with the logic of austerity here I think has been peeled back and we've seen so many times now in the last decade and we're seeing it around us now that where there is a consensus and, polit and, uh, and political weight behind something we can move mountains to make things happen. I think in Paul's own backyard, if you like, in the area of renewable energy technology, the fact that since 2013, we've seen more renewable energy implemented capacity sort of brought on stream than coal, oil and gas combined. And the fact that it's kind of multi-technology, that it's distributed and that we know that the benefits are maximised when it's community owned, that these are incredibly sort of energising um, energizing things. And I think the transition town movement that perhaps have plateaued in this country, it still grows internationally, has shown how you can develop a very local vision of uh, a flourishing neighborhood that you would like to see. So I think pretty much wherever you look, things are, things are happening. But, but obviously, Julia is absolutely right that there's always countervailing forces. There's always people who will try to drag it back. Um, in a different in a different direction and i think perhaps the the, the 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 thing that we're all experimenting with still is finding the chemistry of a movement where all the different actors can add to what each other are doing that we can we can move kind of forward together on this learn from each other um yeah. and as effectively get to the point where we can see um people in power who are interested and understand that we need to move at the scale and the speed that the science and tells us is necessary and i think we're on the cusp we've been experimenting with it we're getting better at it but that's something that we haven't quite cracked yet that would be my question for julia really what's your reflections on how we can overcome the incumbency and build a wave behind the review, rebooting a positive future rather than tripping back to normal in terms of societal shifts. I'd welcome your wisdom on that. That alternative future is, is there. It's there for the taking. It's not even hard, you know, and, and, and that's something that is, is true and to some extent is, is ever more true but has been true for a while. So I think that what it takes to overcome or to move fast is the, the, the understanding that we're actually in a pretty big fight, right? So it's not that we're, there is an alternative future and once everybody is aware of climate science and uh, you know, that, that information or knowledge will be enough to just sort of convince everybody to get there. That it's just a question of, um, that that's the only barrier we have to overcome. It's just sort of an information barrier or a consensus barrier. I think that the barrier is much stronger and it has to do with quite frankly, the most powerful forces in society, which are the, which boil down to the profit motive in economics. So the most profitable, large financial institutions in the world. Um, so be that the fossil fuel companies, be it the, you know, the, the backbone of our industrial economies, the automotive industry, uh, they like to present themselves at the backbone, that's for sure. Uh, whether or not they can really lay claim to that is separate. Um, or the road building, road building, seeing itself as apolitical, you know, we're, we're there for growth, we're there for recession, we're there to restart, we're there to keep coasting. I mean, we're always necessary, regardless of what you say. So all of these, these industries are industries that have very um, uh, core interests in stopping these transitions and have been successfully stopping them for decades. Uh, the other thing that they have is they have very strong presence at the seats of power. So they get a, you know, Richard Branson gets to talk to the UK government in ways that we can't. Um, and these, being aware that we're in that kind of conflict, I think is really important. That it's an economic conflict, that it has to do with power. Um, and we, so it means that in order to be able to get to this possible better future, we have a real fight on our hands and we have to name and shame and uh, really fight the, the culprits who are stopping us from doing it and make it visible to other people that the bad situation we are in is because of these other people standing in the way, these other entities standing in the way. So for me, I see it in a, as a sort of very sort of Manichaean um, struggle. So it's a social struggle. It's, it's a big struggle. It's the struggle of our time. And, uh, and we, I don't think we can get there without communicating that struggle 
who we're up against, why we're up against them, what they've been up to, and how we fight them. Mm -hmm. For me, those are the, the, the key things that will make it successful. Yep. Can I have two quick points on there? Just w yeah. one which is yeah. slightly hopeful. One, one being that the same people who brought the successful legal challenge to Heathrow expansion have now brought the challenge to the 27 billion roads program, um, which is interesting. And um, given the fact that we have the head of the AA standing up and saying that um, fewer people are going to be driving in future, the logic of keeping uh, going ahead with the roads program um, it, it tends to crumble. And the arguments in favor of spending the money in, in other and better ways uh, obviously get stronger. And obviously, we're living in the shadow of um, a general election in the United Kingdom a, a while ago, where if the outcome had been different, we would be on a very different path at the moment. Now, there's a, a very, I'm, I should say, I'm not a Labour Party member, I've always been a Green Party member. Um, but I think there would have been a very different outcome if the, you know, if the opposition had won, and we'd be on a different course there. Now, there were lots of reasons why, um, why, uh, and lots of complicated, um, reasons of vested interest and sort of psychological factors um, about and, and reasons to do with how the story was told and how things were framed that, that kind of explain that. But that means that we still have to kind of keep building in an extra parliamentary way. But also, even within Parliament now, there are attempts to kind of rebuild um, um, amongst people who do share uh, the commitment to moving to zero carbon. And there's a, an all-party parliamentary group on the Green New Deal um, forming and its first act is going to be um, an inquiry into a just recovery, which will be more than inquiry. It will be an attempt to go out and help network with the um, community based organizations around the country who are actively working locally to do kind of local Green New Deals, etc. But to translate that through into a presence within Parliament that can be there for when the, the moment arises. And it does ultimately come down to the who is in a position to make those big decisions so um even those of us who might perhaps be more comfortable engaging in in politics and community activism at the local level at some point or other we have to deal with the really gritty problems of power at the national and international level too i think there's also a big lesson for the incumbency that the reality of the physics or the reality of the biology trumps the politics that the actual impacts of climate or pandemics are, are not, you can't talk your way out of them. Although talking is important, it's that the physical laws really, really cause huge disruptions and huge losses for the incumbency. So I think the one thing for certain is that we'll be referring to this time, these, this period that we're in now for decades just like we, we still look back on the banking crisis. So let's be sure we understand where we are as well as we possibly can, because in this time where normality is interrupted, we have the chance to truly ask ourselves, how do we want to live? What does a net zero world look like in which people can live together in solidarity for decades and decades and decades without further unprecedented collapse? And from that, begin to work as a team to draw out the opportunities for all sectors of society to begin to build that world. It's interesting that, that you talk about imagination because there's that um, quote, I can't remember who it's attributed to, that it's easier to imagine the end of the world, the end of the world than imagine the end of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And certainly some of the politicians who I've spoken to, the idea that there is another or a different way of organizing our economic system or organizing the way that we live to provide ourselves with um you know with with uh food and shelter and uh, leisure time and the ability to lead meaningful lives the idea you can do that in a different way that we currently do it is literally unimaginable to to them and so it's it is interesting that it it is does seem to be as much about imagination as about technology and and maybe julia touching a little bit on your introduction it's also about us as citizens getting involved so one of the liberating things about joining the extinction rebellion for me was the ability to act the ability to be an active citizen in light of this unfolding crisis that that was facing me and i wondered maybe if you could expand a little bit more about 
and, and maybe you also as, as well, well, actually all three of you, about the nature yeah. of us as citizens becoming involved. It's a really good challenge, Sarah. And, and interestingly enough, that quote you mentioned about it being easier to imagine the end of the world than a fundamental change to the economic system, it's been so resonant that I've seen it attributed to at least five different people on the World Wide mm. Web, everyone from Mark Fisher to um, George Soros. So it clearly resonates. And actually part of the fundamental reason for creating the Rapid Transition Alliance was to get over that gap of imagination and belief that you were talking about. Because um, I, when I, was, I worked at the New Economics Foundation as their policy director for quite a while, and one afternoon I sat down and I kind of, I played a version of sort of like fantasy economics or fantasy politics in which I tried to imagine my ideal nation state with its transport system, its energy system, its type of government, etc. And pretty much wherever I looked in terms of, you know, a zero carbon energy system, you know, a brilliant public transport system, there was an example out there in the world. They just weren't all in the same place. So one of the reasons for doing the Rapid Transition Alliance was to not talk about theory, but to highlight and try and shine a light on all those real world living, breathing breathing examples where things are being done better, which show the potential for change. I believe there's a sort of fashion bit of language um, talking about prefigurative politics, so you can actually kind of get hold of something tangible and see it, and right from different forms of effective community organizing, but also through to, you know, zero carbon um, transport systems and energy systems that the examples are emerging and many of them are already out there. We just need to kind of join the dots and bring them together. I agree. And I suppose what I might add to it is um, if we're thinking beyond where we are now, the pandemic itself is a really hard teacher with many millions dying. But imagine if we're all learning new lessons from a global Green New Deal Marshall Plan, where we, we're not locked in at home, but much more of us are exploring how we can work at home. We see the air is cleaner, not because everything's shut down, because we're doing things differently. We fly less, we get more from nature. The kids are excited about the future. We aren't worried about food security in the same way. That pull from that exciting future, what inspires me is that the scientists and the engineers in the past were, tended to be more polymaths, where you weren't just rooted in the numbers. You could explore art and creativity as well, but it's important to be rooted in the numbers. We can't just imagine things. If we calculate them, we find the numbers stack up very well for the shift that we're talking about and the numbers stack up terribly for going back to business as usual. So let's use that route and the pull from the thought of a, a more exciting future to take us there. I agree completely with this call for a positive future, but I'm also thinking, I also think that one of the lessons from coronavirus is the reasonable testimony from the experts in the WHO that being prepared, you know, investing in pandemic preparedness, acting early, shutting things down before things got really bad, hasn't stopped this country from having one of the worst death tolls worldwide. worldwide. So the fact that there was a possible positive future based on reasonable investments and reasonable activities is not something that our government decided to listen to. What they just, what they, every step of the way, I think this is one of the really big lessons to me, and I'm hoping that other climate scientists are paying attention, is that this government only acted on an actual fast moving deadly pandemic of which they had an example next door in Italy, like just weeks prior, only when they were pushed by pe the public, the media, and epidemiology experts literally screaming at them nonstop. That is the only thing that budged them every slow step of the way. And still budging them now on protective equipment, for instance, which they still haven't admitted is a real issue. Or testing, which they still haven't decided to really do. They're just talking about it. So I think we I think in terms of what shifts the power that be, and yes, of course, if we'd had another a different election outcome, we'd be talking in a different way. But we 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 go into global crises with the governments we have, to paraphrase Donald Rumsfeld, right? Not the, not the governments we'd like to have. And I think that these governments, the, the right-wing governments, the neoliberal governments, they only listen to force. They only listen to social coercion from experts, media, and public, and activists. That is the only thing that will move them. And it's not nice coercion. It's screaming, shoving, pushing, yelling, and saying, if you do not act on this fast now, we will make your life a living hell. We will never shut up about it. We will blame you for the death that ensue. 
And that's something that we need to do on climate too. We can't be the, the, the polite technocrats writing assessment reports every few years. I mean, I'm on the IPCC, this is what we do. We write polite reports, very careful, very carefully worded, not policy prescriptive. That's not gonna get us anywhere. Look where it got the epidemiologists, look where it got the WHO, look where it got the pandemic specialists. We need to be out there screaming, screaming on media, screaming uh, in government meetings, screaming with activists. This is, you know, that's my big, one of my big take home messages is how reluctant our government has been to act to prevent mass death. Andrew, Paul, do you basically accept Julia's um, point, argument, that we have to struggle politically? It's not enough just to lay this out nice and nice and neatly, and, you know, yeah. which is what we've done as part of the environmental movement. You know, well, I, I say we. It's what I did as part of the environmental movement for 25-odd years. Yeah, you know, do we accept that we are actually in this, this, this is a fight and it's a political struggle and, you know, it's probably going to get quite nasty. Yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree with what Julia is saying. And I think I, I would add perhaps that if we weren't in lockdown, the streets would be full of people campaigning against the inadequate policies of government. But the streets aren't full of people because we're under lockdown but we're still doing stuff. We've seen new leadership. We've seen young people. We've seen people who we wouldn't expect to be saying, yes, I support action on climate. It's not just what's being said. Who's saying it is shifting, but we need to recognize the fundamental point that we do need to change the politics and move the Overton window significantly. I might even push it ever so slightly further. I thought it was kind of quite striking that um, it's taken the current situation um, to get even the uh, scientists of working group three of the IPCC to meet online for one of their review meetings rather than actually kind of flying around the world to all get together physically and I think if we all look to our own lives you know it, it, there's plenty of people I know kind of in the movement who still don't sort of think twice about jumping on a plane and flying around I think you know we all in some to some degree or other it, it's it's shove rather than nudge economics that is, is required to make something happen I, th I remember thinking um, working back in the 1990s doing some work on um, fair, fair trade and and the way that supermarkets sourced from the global south and um, we ran a very effective campaign at one point in which we were sort of on the on the headlines of the news several several days on the trot and because they were household name companies that we were campaigning against they were sort of vulnerable to uh, what we were saying and they got on the defensive and they put sort of new resources and processes in place and and everybody turned around and said okay now we've heard what you said now please um let's just have some positive engagement let's sit around the table and the moment we stopped doing the more um, sort of in your face aggressive public campaigning they took their foot off the pedal and went back to their old ways and we were dealing with exactly the same problems five years later. So I think one of our great challenges and one of our great challenges as a movement, and it's something that anybody who's ever been an activist experiences, is how to sustain. And this again comes back to one of the things about how we get an ecology of, of, um, of agents of change, of organizations gearing up for change. And even within XR itself, everybody experiences this thing about, you know, you you build up to big kind of moments for making a making an intervention and, and a kind of applying pressure. Everybody gets burnt out and tired and we all get back home. And I think one of our great challenges is how we organize ourselves for precisely the kind of relentless, consistent pressure that Julia is talking about. And that's something we need to keep experimenting with, I think. Collectively, we are an organism and each individual group might be have one specific function, but let's let's collaborate. Let's join up and become a big thing so that we feel part of a much larger team rather than just battling on in our own eight-person NGO or our own university department to become a wave. So um, I've got a nice question here on the on the chat from Claude Fourcroy. Claude, yes, I probably should have tried to say that in the French accent. Um, do you think that COVID-19 will amplify or dampen down activism as more people will be struggling to make ends meet? So, I mean, I, I think one of the things that COVID-19 has done uh, very successfully is made a global crisis that most people see as being outside of their everyday lives and certainly with the climate, the, the emergency of the natural world, it's made a global crisis very much an uh, end of the month emergency for very many people. You know, and that's that's also happened in my own household. We have had a just a total and catastrophic loss of income overnight. It's been utterly amazing. 
And so, you know, the end of the world has very much become uh, end of the month kitchen table problem. Uh, so yes, will, will COVID-19 amplify or dampen down activism on the uh, action on the climate and ecological emergency, do you think? I'd say nothing is given. I'd say it depends very much what we do. I'd say you've got the you've got the circumstances and potential for either outcome to happen. That the the collective experience, the, the the momentary clarity, the literal and metaphorical clearing of clearing of the skies, where you can see some other and better ways of doing things, creates potential. I think the a unifying collective experience creates the the potential for common action. Um, if what you what we see politically and, and obviously we're not just talking about in the united kingdom but we are also talking about the united kingdom as well you see people falling back on a repeat of the old logic and austerity uh, of, of austerity economics a lot of people are going to be in extremely hard circumstances but even then i would say the outcome is unlikely because if you push people too far they mobilize they get active and they start fighting for their interests you like you could see um huge problems in the housing market here you could have a negative equity crisis which might bring people together to campaign around that so i think there's 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 the, there's the potential for many different things to happen but i would say that there in in the shared collective experience there is the possibility of having more effective unified action the shared collective experience is the positive and there are things that we're hearing about now that even just a month six weeks ago we wouldn't have considered could be actually happening like you know, national income for citizens in countries or just the, the concept of mutual aid has moved from something that not many people talked about to so many people have talked about. I've had a letter dropped off here giving us the telephone numbers of all the people who live around us so we can all ring each other and check on each other. I think it's that collective coming together of humans and the breaking down of normality that we know there can be other realities than normal are the positives but yes there are hardships and there are deaths so we have to recognize that take a deep breath and put our arms around each other at a distance if you know what i mean i'd like to bring us back to oil actually and um, because we've talked a little bit around uh, around the politics and the difficulty of shifting our political system and although we didn't make reference to it, the idea of uh, Naomi Klein's shock doctrine and corona, coronavirus economics, uh, the, the, her, her video that she's got on Intercept, which, which is quite good. So we've talked about that, we understand those problems, but we know the issue of burning carbon. And we, so we know the issue of, of, of fossil fuels. So, but why is it so difficult to give up oil because the people who are currently investing in it, the McKinsey report, the leaked JP Morgan report, these, the, the people assessing risk, the bankers, the oil companies, they all know what, what's happening. Are they all there with their fingers crossed, just going, I think we're going to get away with it? Or do they know and not care? I would say never underestimate inertia. Um, you know, you've got the top five companies uh, investing 200 million in lobbying and, uh, and advertising against environmental regulation. And you've got, according to Mervyn King, the former governor of the Bank of England, you've got the majors currently investing in a four degree future. Um, uh, so you've got a vast amount of vested interest. You've got a um, you've got a path dependency with the infrastructure involved. You've got the fact that um, I, you know I know this is a kind of a common insight now, but the way in which oil and and you know its derivative products are. Uh, just drenched through the economy in so many different ways and the physical act of um, re-engineering the infrastructure, the oil dependent infrastructure, you've got uh, a, a pension system which is you know, heavily dependent on having its kind of, I mean, apart from a very small number of uh, the sort of at the ultra ethical end of the market, the vast majority of pensions are um, weighted with uh, significant investments in oil. So you've got both an economical, a physical, an infrastructure structure, a power invested interest base, all geared around keeping things as they are and maximizing the extraction and use of fossil fuels. So that's just a way of saying that it's a massive and comprehensive exercise to change that. I mean, one of the reasons why, you know, all the great work being done by people like Carbon Tracker, one of the reasons why we were trying to simplify the policy ask by coming up with a kind of a line in the sand type approach of saying um, we need something like a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty because to flip what I just said and talk about whether there are possibilities and opportunities, you've actually got a lot of activity concentrated in 
in a very relatively small number of hands in terms of corporations and producers. So um, it does focus down on where the problem is and, and where you need to get things to change. Is the collapse of the oil price going to change that? I have a very hard time understanding what's going on with the collapse of the oil price. I think that this is a geopolitical struggle uh, and that basically various factions are trying to put each other out of business and playing a very, very dangerous game indeed. Um, I think that in terms of the oil companies, there's always two different sides to it. There's some people saying, oh, well, they see the writing on the wall. They know they can't keep going for very long, but they're going to try to make as much money as they can and delay that day as much as they can. And I think that that's what we've been seeing for the past decades. Um, and maybe we're seeing it play out now, but we're seeing it play out too slowly and in a very um, geopolitically dangerous way as well. So I think that one of the things I would really push for here, which um, was an idea that I first came across from uh, the Next Systems uh, Project, which is um, a, U a US think tank, uh, which is really, really amazing, does amazing work, I really recommend them, is the idea of nationalizing the oil industry. So basically saying these, these things are too dangerous in the private realm, where they are going to be playing these dangerous games. Remember, that during the COVID crisis, Donald Trump has suspended all regulations of the oil industry. They have no environmental regulations anymore. There is nothing preventing them from trying to get the oil back price back up by just causing like oil spills galore. They could just pump the stuff out of the ground and dump it into the Gulf of Mexico or into the Alaska. So you know, that they're literally free from any illegal repercussions from this at this point, or any regulatory repercussions. So um, I think what we have to, so the idea of nationalizing is now is a great time to nationalize these industries you just, you, because they, they're cheap, because they don't, have, they don't have any profitability anymore currently as it stands. Uh, so bring them under public control and ramp them down deliberately. So bring their assets under public control, boom grant them down to zero. That this is the, that this is what the, I call it caging and extinguishing the fossil dragon. And I think that this is a perfectly uh, reasonable policy to push for. Uh, and the time has never been better. So COVID is the perfect moment to do this because uh, financially it makes a lot of sense for governments to do this. And then we get, we, then we're free from all their disinformation, all their lobbying, all their buying of politicians, et cetera. So I think that this is a, a direction that's well worth investigating. And I don't think that consumption necessarily has to go up because we have very, very efficient technologies right now that actually um, allow us to get a lot of services. We call energy services or material services, the good things we get from energy and resource use to get them at much and much lower environmental impact. So material and energy consumption does not have to go up for living standards to go up. Uh, and so uh, that's one thing I would just clarify. And I think it is possible to reach decent living standards at lower, much, much lower consumption levels than we are now. Um, so I think that was sort of the consumption. Does consumption have to go up? If we leave these companies in charge, it will, because that's their profit motive. If we take them out of commission, then it doesn't. Um, certainly not for our well-being, uh, long term or short term. Back at the New Economics Foundation, when I was working there, we devised one of the indicators, which is an alternative to GDP to measure the success of the economy, where we brought together the sort of um, the happy life years indicator, which is your relative life expectancy and your relative well-being compared with your ecological footprint. And um, we did a very, very large survey looking across Europe. And the rule of thumb was that even though people's um, level of consumption ranged from one planet living, which is actually incredibly hard to get to that low um, when you're locked into a system of high consumption right up to eight planet living but what we noted was that in terms of people's self-reported subjective experience of their own lives and their own well-being there was no meaningful relationship between whether you were eight planet living or one planet living you were just as likely to have as high a level of self um, uh, worth and well-being at one planet living as you were at eight planet living in terms of zero carbon, does it mean green, all greenhouse gases? I think that's just something I'd like to clarify. Zero carbon means only carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide is the only greenhouse gas that we know how to take out of the atmosphere through trees or other mechanisms. So when people talk about zero carbon, they're talking about zero carbon for a reason and they don't mean methane, so CH4, despite the fact that CH4 has carbon in it, uh, they mean CO2 because you can get CO2 out of the air using various means, 
good, bad, indifferent. Um, so the idea of a zero carbon economy is that you get your carbon emissions down low, not to zero, but then you compensate them by these other mechanisms. And then maybe you even compensate these other greenhouse gases in terms of the warming that they would do. Um, and you can ramp down the other greenhouse gases. The idea is you also ramp down the other greenhouse gases, so methane, nitrous oxides, um, as low as you can. But as long as we have agriculture, we're not gonna get those to zero. We can change agriculture, we can go plant-based, um, we can change the way we interact with soil, all of that good stuff, but we're never gonna get those greenhouse gases to net to actual zero. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and there's a lot of debate on how much net, the idea of zero carbon allows you to emit and then compensate afterwards. And I agree that that's a very contentious issue and we should really be focusing on the zero part, not the net part. We had one about the military as well. The military emissions are considerable. Uh, the the bit, people doing the best research on that are at the University of Lancaster, I believe. They've been able to get lots of information from the US military, which is of course bigger than all others combined. Uh, so <laughs> they, they've been able to get freedom of information, knowledge about what the, what the US military consumes and emits, and it's tremendous. However, it is not as much as the rest of the US or in, any, in all other countries, uh, generally, you know, general consumption, production, is more than what the military does. So the military is definitely a big issue, definitely needs to be regulated, but it's not the mass of what we're talking about uh, in terms of the, the magnitude of it. Um, oh, and the use of the internet. Using the internet is bad uh, in terms of using energy, maybe. It's not anywhere near as bad as driving to work. Not even close. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we're on Zoom, the fact that we're watching Netflix, um, there, there are various studies. There's some that really exaggerate sort of the, the energy use. The, these, these streaming companies are getting very efficient as well. It's not like uh, if a movie is popular, you have to re-download it every time. They have it ready to go in various ways. So um, it's, I have a student uh, who was really into this and he looked into it and looked at all the, the re most recent data. It turns out internet usage is not, um, uh, as terrible as other things, and it's certainly not as terrible as other things if it substitutes for energy intensive modes of transportation. I also work with a group called Scientists for Global Responsibility who have done a lot of work on um, issues around demilitarization over the years and are working on climate change in the military at the moment. There's a big report coming out um, quite soon. They are based in Lancaster um, and work with the people at Lancaster University. And, um, and it's absolutely the case that military emissions are large. They're very hard to track because there is a deficit of information uh, about them um, internationally but one of the things we do know is that military emissions from the military are often left out of greenhouse gas inventories so they're not included in the targets and our, and our, our efforts to get towards the targets in many many countries um, but a rough rule of thumb is that their uh, emissions are thought to be possibly on a level with civil aviation um, when you add everything up together. It's been so interesting thank you so much for giving us your insights um, yeah, I'm yeah and I just feel really honoured to have been in the same uh, Zoom room as, as you three. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Very much.